and we're back for more! Uh, this time we're going to focus on the equipment of the Cohort Legion, rather than the structure. This is one more thing that starts with Marius. Before the time of Marius, Roman legions would travel with huge numbers of pack animals and carts in order to bring all of the stuff that they needed to fight with including things like tents and food and so on and so forth. This created a weakness because the Roman army, if you attacked them while they were marching, you could cut them off from their supply train and thus create a situation where they would be starving without their tents caught out in the middle of nowhere and you could pick them off. So Marius, in order to deal with the raiding parties in the posed by the Cimbri and the Teutones, got his men to carry a lot more than they had used to be carrying. So in addition to their personal gear, their armor, their helmets, their weapons, and their shields, they would also carry a certain amount of camp gear. So tent poles, tent stakes, tent leather. Roman tents were made out of oiled leather hide. So very, very heavy, these tents cooking equipment, including grills, your food supplies, your rations, all of this would be carried on a backpack. We'll look at exactly what that backpack was, but this image I start you off with so you can see what Marius' soldiers looked like. When he first asked them to do this, some comedians in the unit decided that he was treating them like mules. So the joke was, oh yeah, we're Marius's mules. In other words, Marius is making us carry stuff as if we were pack animals and not legionaries. This is beneath our dignity, grumble, grumble. Except then they started winning a lot because this is a great idea. They were no longer getting cut off from their supply train. They had their food. They were able to move a lot more quickly too. Marius's army could cover a lot more distance in a day because they could be decoupled from their baggage train without losing too much of their nightly defenses. Some of the things you'd carry would be the equipment to make a palisade wall for the night so you could minimally fortify yourself in the field. So then this nickname for themselves of Marius's mules became a point of pride. People would brag about, yeah, I was one of Marius's mules, I was one of the originals, it's so awesome. Which just goes to show you that if you make a controversial leadership decision that works out well, then you can turn a bad social situation into a good one. Just you know, be prepared for it not to work. Only this, this did work. This is a good idea. So as to those packs, we're here looking at uh, the column of Marcus Aurelius, I think this is from. So this is one of our bits of evidence showing what uh, an individual soldier or a mule would be carrying on his backpack stick. So these were a couple of sticks lashed together in a T shape, and then you would tie all of your gear onto that stick. More about it later. You can see some of the components, and I'm gonna outline these in different colors of pens, starting with this parcel here. So this is a rawhide satchel that's got reinforcing straps and it's rawhide oiled and waxed so that it's waterproof. So that's where you put things like clean dry socks and underwear and stuff that you don't want to get spoiled. That goes there. Then also in red is a cooking pot. So this is a pot with a handle that you can both cook in and then eat out of. So it's a combo mess kit. There's also some kind of crockery there. This could contain both olive oil and flour. Some combination of olive oil and flour on a griddle pan was used to make marching bread. So Romans would carry that and then also and probably that's what's going on either, let me do this in green, so either here in this net bag or here, this kind of lumpy parcel thing, would be preserved salt meat, so like prosciutto. So bacon and pancakes is the breakfast 
lunch and dinner of champions for Roman soldiers in the field. Delicious, I'm sure, but if you have to eat it every day, especially if you're grinding it on hand mills with very coarse flour, it's very hard on your teeth. Roman soldiers nearing retirement frequently had lost most of their teeth, either through interpersonal violence or through poor nutrition and tooth loss, so much so that we have a report of this one legionary when he was trying to get his general to take pity on him and give him his retirement package already. He takes the general's hands and sticks it into his mouth to be like, look, I'm all gums. And that sounds like I'm making fun of him, but I'm not. It's kind of horrifying to me uh, because not all Romans lost all of their teeth. Like this isn't normal for ancient world health. It's a point to how unreliable a soldier's diet could be and also how gritty this flower was and just how hard and violent this kind of life could be. And not violent in um, your fighting Rome's enemies way violent, but also you're getting hit by your commanders and you're in a group of rowdy dudes who are bored and drunk and also living in places where you're being exposed to strange new diseases. My point being, it's a rough life. Pancakes are delicious. So here's, I'm sorry, a very fuzzy picture, but it's one of the better ones showing an entire legionary's kit. Just to give you an idea of how much stuff an individual legionary was carrying, um, let me take you on the quick tour of what is in here, using my blue again. So this here is a, a sudes or sudarium. Sorry, sudarium is a napkin, sudes are the steaks. These are used either to make um, pointed, kind of like we use barbed wire coils on the top of walls. They'd use these on the top of earthenwork walls as stakes, or they'd put them in ditches so that horses or people would step and stumble into them. And you can arrange them in different ways to make different defensive emplacements. Then there's an axe for cutting down wood because you don't bring all of your wood into the field, you have to cut it down. This is a shovel. You use this for digging latrines, which is important. There's a pickaxe, there's a pruning hook. All of these are used to make stuff in the field and build temporary shelters and also to build siege equipment. You could also specialize. So one in every tent mate group if you were in a really good legion, but at least in every 10 tent cohort, you would have one person who was trained in first aid and um, paramedic kind of stuff. That would be your medicus. And then there would be a whole core of medical professionals on top of that by the time you get into the first century CE. So there is a whole medical training apparatus that's part of the Roman army, as well as an engineering corps where you would learn how to build walls and buildings and aqueducts and things. One of the things Romans would do to keep their army occupied when they weren't immediately in the process of conquering people was they would make them build roads and walls and baths and aqueducts and infrastructure things both because infrastructure is helpful but also infrastructure builds keep your legionaries busy and tired and not beating up local people for their chickens as much they're still beating up local people for their chickens a lot even though they're not supposed to they totally do so i mentioned the lash together sticks that you're using as a carrying tool. Here it is. This is a furca, is the name of this carrying stick apparatus. So it's a stick like you see on cartoon people who are running away from home where they've got a little bag tied onto a stick. But the cross piece allows you to tie more things onto the stick and it also creates a crook that you can hold onto your shoulder. So this isn't a backpack strapped onto you. That's a feature, not a bug. 
if you're attacked while you're marching, all you have to do to unburden yourself is to let go of the end of the stick. It'll drop behind you, freeing up your front for you to take out your shield, take out your sword, get into formation and fight. And because you're marching in your formation, a Roman legion can go very quickly from marching and bag carrying to fighting without a lot of disruption. So also on this kit is a reproduction of a Roman griddle and mess kit, which I love. That's a, a foldable marching grill, and this ring on the side of it you would tie onto your furka so that you could carry it as part of your gear stick. It's a pretty nifty way of doing things. Also notice the canteen. Canteens are a thing. Romans had them. Now on to armor. When we last checked in with Romans, they have chain mail. We were seeing some uh, basic chest protection. You get more options as we move ahead though. Beginning with the last Punic Wars into the first century BCE, the Lorica Squamata or scale armor became an option. This is very popular among cavalry officers because if you overlap the scales so that the lip, this part here, let me do this with red, here is facing upwards, then upward facing blows are going to glance off of your armor, but you're still going to be able to tilt and move and do what you need to do to stay on your horse. However, the scales can be overlapped top down as is the case in this surviving fragment of uh, Lorica Squamata, in order to protect you from above, from things falling down, or downward strokes of swords and spears and so on. Scale mail was popular for all the reasons chain mail was. It provided a little bit more protection than chain mail, a little less flexibility, but still very flexible, modular. You can use either loops, as is the case on this Lorica Squamata. So this is done with metal loops holding the different scales together. This one has metal loops on it, but also traces from where leather and sinew ties were attached. You could also make these out of leather. So we do have met metal examples surviving. They're also combinations of metal and leather together to give you a good balance of protection, mobility, and um, practicality. It's just a great all-around way of doing your armor. But it could be pretty heavy, so there, there's a little bit of a trade-off here, but not much. Uh, Lorica, by the way, is the same word we were using with the Lorica Hamata. You remember the Lorica Hamata is the chainmail Lorica. A Lorica is an armored shirt. So it armors both the front and the back of the body, and um, it's essentially the, the same principle as a cuirass. This is just the Roman word for a cuirass, is a lorica. So this is the Lake Trasimene lorica, which I'm just telling you about because you may still find it listed as an actual artifact. If it were an actual artifact, we would be so happy because it's from the site of a major Roman defeat. Lake Trasimene was a ridiculously large defeat. So this would have been actual Roman armor that we could date to an actual Roman battle. And look at it. All of the parts are there. The whole shirt is there. Even the little cap sleeves are on it with little epaulets. This is perfect. This would have been the find of the century, except it's not. It's a forgery. That's a forgery. Yeah, so if you see the Lake Trasimene Lorica um, dated to the 200s BCE, it's fake. There's going to be a question about this, just so you know. Yeah, Lake Trasimene Lorica, fake. What's not fake, however, is this Aquilifer. So this is from a tombstone of an Aquilifer where he's proudly wearing his fancy pants Lorica Squamata, his scale armor. You can see because he's an Aquilifer, he's on foot. So his scales are draped top down. And you can see his eagle right there. There's his Aquila. So here he is on his tombstone, still carrying the eagle into eternity. Go him. Good job. Next up is the classic of Roman armor, the Lorica Segmentata. 
Now this is what you would get if you possibly could, because this is the perfect marriage of flexibility, modular construction, and protection. So this is made with strips of iron, iron that are connected by thongs or sinews with riveted plates. You can see here both the remains of an ancient Lorica segmentata. So these rusted bits, those are the originals. These were find, found, I think, in Mainz in Germany. On the other side is the reconstruction. This is what it would have looked like back in the day. Here's a bronze sculpture of a soldier wearing his Lorica segmentata. So this is what you're going to see Roman soldiers in most of the time on TV and in the movies and things, because it's pretty iconic. Uh, however, sometimes you'll see people wearing leather loricae segmentati. That's stupid. Uh, your pieces of leather are just going to roll and fold over. There's no real bonus to making this in leather. The entire point of this armor is to make metal plate flexible. And if you're not using a medical metal plate, then you've completely like lost the script here. So if you ever see this made out of leather, you can feel super superior and cast as much shade as you want because it's, that's nonsense. But metal ones, it's a great idea. So here are the inner workings of a Lorica segmentata. And you can see that there's already one big improvement over the kind of archaic cuirass we were looking at in archaic Greece, where the seam lines are going along the ribs on either side of the body. Instead, we have the openings at the spine and at the midline of the body. This creates overlap at the spine and the midline, and it also doesn't create lips that are gonna hang you up so that you can move your body side to side like this. So when you're in a Lorica segmentata, even more so of it than scale, although I mean, your mileage may vary on this one, you can bend over sideways to pick things up. So this gives you a lot of flexibility. This entire assembly, because it can be laced, it can be tightened up very close to the body. So it's a really precise fit that also kind of holds you in and provides back support. And this is necessary for long marching trips. It also redistributes the weight of the lorica onto your body so that you're not carrying all of it on your shoulders and your waist, but rather throughout your torso. Your knees are still going to feel it, but it's a great compromise between flexibility and weight. And remember, chainmail is very heavy because you have loops and loops and loops. There's a lot of metal in chainmail. Scamo, likewise, because it's all these overlapping plates, it's quite heavy. The Lorica segmentata is not as heavy. It's a nice little jaunty jacket. Stylish. The, the shoulder pauldrons, by the way, are also attached. Another benefit of this, you have leather attached with rivets, but these rivets can be very easily swapped out and repaired in the field. And you don't need anything more than a travel mortar and a, a ball peen hammer, and you can fix these yourself. So it doesn't require fancy armoring or anything. And it, you don't even need a lot of skill to make the strips because these are just horizontal strips of metal that have their edges folded so they aren't cutting into you. But this isn't a, as complicated a kind of armor to make as some other kinds of armor. The point I'm getting at here is that for my money, if I had to pick some Roman armor, I'd go for the Lorica Segmentata. Lorica Segmentata, yes, no? Probably. Probably. It's I mean, pretty chain nice. Chainmail is very hard to beat for ease of use. Heavy, though. Well, so is the Lorica. I know. All right. Time, time. Um, yes. So here are some fancy modern Romans modeling their Lorica segmentati. And here you can see the back lacing. Uh, the front lacing also makes it very easy to put this on yourself is an important consideration in the field. This is easier in many ways to put on than uh, chain, chain mail, both putting on and taking off. If you've never had the pleasure of taking off chain mail and ever get the opportunity, do it because it's a lot harder than it looks. Because once it's on you, you have to kind of like bend over upside down to get it to slither off of you. And it's very awkward. You look absolutely silly doing it. 
at least I look silly. So the one last bit of armor, equally iconic and pretty much unchanged since archaic Greece, is the lorica musculata, which is exactly what it sounds like. So this is the um, the truck nuts of Roman military gear. This is how you can be heroically nude and still wear armor while falsely advertising the state of your abs. This is a lorica in which you have your heroic nudity molded into your armor and then you strap it onto your body so that no matter what's underneath, you're going to come out looking like a bronzed hunk. This is a very early one, as you can see, this dates to 370 to 340. So you do get these very early on. We've had them since Archaic Greece. This isn't new, but it's worth bringing them up again now because these are not something that everybody's going to have, right? Not even your Primus Pilus Centurion is going to be wandering around with one of these doohickeys. Lorcae musculati are for commanding officers and generals. So this is the stuff that you wear if you are wealthy enough to afford vanity armor. And this is the kind of stuff that you wear in your portraits. Uh, you may remember Tiberius was wearing one of these things. And it's no coincidence that these are often uh, older, middle-aged commanders, commanders who may need a little bit of help in the abs department, shall we say. That was awfully judgy, sorry, but come on, this, this is compensation armor. This is, why wear that when you can have a Lorica Segmentata? Why? Vanity, vanity is why.